Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the sixth and the last session of a round table with Dr. Star Ahmed. As you remember, he has been talking about the Islamic revolution. Uh, this evening he will explain it fully. Therefore, the topic of today's session is prophetic model of establishing Islam and the total politico socio economic system. I request Dr. Sar Ahmed to please make his discourse. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulihil kareem. Amma baadu fa'uzu billahi min al shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters from Adam and Eve May Allah bless us all and guide us to the right path Before I begin my presentation for this session, I have to make three explanations first. In my morning presentation, when I said that the Indian subcontinent in the 20th century produced four great personalities, at that time, in my mind, those four personalities were Allama Iqbal, Abul Kalam Azad, Maulana Maududi, and Maulana Ilyas, who was the founder of Tablighi Jamah. But when I came to explaining, then this idea came to my mind that he is out of that line, the line, you know, this movement which is which is going and progressing step by step, by generation to generation. Theoretically, it owes its existence to Allama Iqbal. Practically, first attempt was made by Abul Kalam Asad, second by Marana Maududi, and fourth by myself. But I am a humble person. I don't regard myself to be a great person, but I am a humble student of Quran. And I only have been sharing whatever I could learn from Quran. And yes, I want to be engaged in the struggle of establishing Islam as a political, socio economic system. Number two, Brother Muntaz has asked me about my meetings with Marana Madhudi. One thing remained, and that was when I was going to America for the first time in 1979. Maulana Madhudi was also there, but he was sick, ill, under treatment. I very much wished to meet him there, because my main program was in Toronto, Canada, and he was in Buffalo with his son, Dr. Ahmed Farooq, and they are very close. But he was so sick that all visits were banned by the doctors, so I couldn't meet him. But then Malana died there during my visit and I could meet his dead body. I went all the way from Chicago to Buffalo and I had the honor of leading the funeral prayer for him. Now the third is the title of today's talk, Islamic Revolution and Contemporary Pakistan versus a prophetic model of establishing Islam as total political socio economic system. Now, with this, I proceed. First of all, I want to give you my definition of revolution. What I mean by revolution? By revolution, I mean a change, fundamental change in at least one of the three aspects of the political, socio economic system of the society. By French Revolution, only 
a political system change by bolshevik revolution economic system changed but these are real revolutions in iranian revolution also political change came from monarchy to we may say theocracy on the other hand any change in religion is not a revolution the biggest change in the history of religions was in the year round about 300 ce when constantine the emperor roman emperor embraced christianity and the whole roman empire embraced christianity there can be no example of such a conversion mass conversion but nobody has called it a revolution because the political socio economic system remained the same the same monarchy the same emperorship and the same war, everything lords and barons and so on and so forth were so they were so revolution is a fundamental change in at least one aspect of the political socio economic system keeping this definition in view i claim that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought the most profound all embracing revolution of human history there was change in beliefs in personal behaviors in value structure in the social system political system economic system everything was changed you will have to make a research to find something that remained as it was people who were illiterate nobody very few people could read and write and that was converted to a nation who became in the field of knowledge pioneers and inventors of new disciplines people who used to keep fighting 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 and they become so peaceful so disciplined obeying a leader so it was the most profound revolution of human history and here i want to give you some witnesses to that number 1 brother rogers might appreciate it m n roy a bengali hindu a communist and he was the member of the communist international holding a high position he delivered a lecture here in lahore in 1920 in bradla hall in which he said that the greatest revolution of human history was brought about by muhammad this lecture of his is still published in india mumbai under the title historical role of islam ebn roy i gave the testimony of hg wells that it was muhammad who for the first time in history established a society based on the principles of human equality fraternity and freedom and lastly i gave you another testimony from dr michael hart the author of the 100 it was published i think in 1978 from manhattan and he gave the subtitle of his book a selection and gradation of the 100 most influential personalities of human history first he selected 100 names who had changed the course of history and then he gave a gradation who was the maximum one who changed the this brought about the maximum change and then number 2 and number 3 and number 4 and he puts muhammad on top and he says i am a christian and i have put muhammad on top so naturally i owe an explanation I've done this because 
इज दी ओनली पर्सन प्लीज नोट दी ओनली पर्सन सुप्रीमली सक्सेसफुल इन बोथ द रिलीजियस एंड सेक्युलर फील्ड्स आई टोल्ड यू थ्री थिंग्स गो टू मेक रिलीजन सम बिलीव सम मोड्स ऑफ वर्शिप सम सोशल कस्टम्स here also he was extremely successful and with political socio economic order changing the direction he was extremely successful and he is the only person all the others are if they have greatness on this side they might be zero on the other and if they have some greatness on the other side they are zero here gautam buddh and jesus christ himself occupy very high position in religion but what about politics what about the social system it remained as it was same is true of buddha but muhammad brought about the most profound revolution my third point is i have derived the process of a true revolution from the biography or life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i think i have the right to do it because he brought about the biggest revolution to compare with other revolutions french revolution was limited to political change bolshevik revolution limited to economic change and here it was all embracing number 2 in the french revolution the ideology was given by rousseau and so on the writers the intellectuals but they couldn't bring about a revolution even in a village they were not leaders of the revolution revolution was brought about by some other people rowdy and maximum bloodshed bloody revolution in the same case the communist ideology was given by marx and engels they lived in germany they lived in england but both the countries had never had any communist revolution the revolution was brought about by the bolsheviks and the bolsheviks as far away in russia while muhammad started the movement the dawa presented the ideology propagated it organized the people who accepted it and then passing through all stages of revolution even armed conflict he completed the revolution himself and at every step he was the leader he was a street preacher like jesus in makka but he was leading the armies when he was at madina the same person having both these things in his life now i want to explain those six steps that i have derived from the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but i want to describe them in the beginning in secular terminology extracted from the life of muhammad but i will not use the religious terminology but the secular one number one the first prerequisite of a revolution is that there should be some revolutionary ideology first prerequisite this ideology should be such that it cuts at the roots of the political economic system if it doesn't cut at the roots of the social order of the political socio economic system then it's a sermon it's something religious moral not nothing else the revolutionary ideology is the one which cuts at the roots of the existing political socio economic system now this ideology either and better should be new so that people can take it at the face value 
But if it is an old ideology, then it has to be reinterpreted in the idiom of the time. So that the people, intelligentsia of that time can understand. Now the first step is to propagate this ideology by all the means available. Now coming to the second step. The second step would be and essentially is to organize the people who have accepted this revolutionary ideology into a disciplined party. This party also should fulfill two prerequisites. Number one, it should be fully disciplined. Listen and obey the discipline of army. The proverbial discipline of army. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. In Islamic terminology it is some power. Listen and obey. That's all. No questioning. And number two, in that party, if there are in the society some cadres, this is high, this is low, this is high, these cadres should not be represented in this party. The position of the people should be determined by the depth of their devotion, the amount of sacrifice they make. For example, in Indian society, Brahman is higher up, sugar is very low. If this is the condition in Communist Party, then it is not a revolutionary party at all. Here the position of a person would be determined by, the, by his depth of commitment and the amount of sacrifice that he puts in. Number three is the training of the carters. In this training, first objective is to hammer down the revolutionary ideology in their minds. Hammer it down, hammer it down, repeat and repeat and repeat. So that it remains before them. Because all their strength and all their intentions to work, they actually emerge from that ideology. So you can have meetings, study circles, studying that ideology, exchanging views, that should be kept continuous. Number two, they should be accustomed to obeying this discipline. It's not an easy job. I am also a human being, he is also a human being, why should I obey him? But, party, party discipline means you have to obey your superiors. And you have to be accustomed to it, listening and obeying. Number three, if the social order that you want to establish, has some spiritual dimension also, then the purification of the selves is the third prerequisite of this training. And here it will mean the purification of the niya, the intention. For Islamic revolution, the intention has to be only one pleasing their Lord and having salvation in the hereafter. Not for establishing your own hegemony or for worldly gains to establish imperialism. No. To be famous, to have a position of commanding something, some force. No, no. Only whatever they work for the pleasure of Allah, God, 
and seeking salvation in the hereafter. Now these three steps, we can say they are one actually. One in three, three in one. Brother Muntaz Ahmed is not here. <laughs> he would have been happy. So, in Islamic terminology now, what is the revolutionary ideology? We call it Tawheed. But what are the revolutionary implications of Tawheed? Is it only an Aqeedah? No. First of all, it means sovereignty belongs to him. Anyone claiming sovereignty is in rebellion against him. This is the biggest challenge to the status quo. Number two, everything belongs to him. You are not owners. You are custodians only. You are trustees only. Whatever you own, so to say, you can use it only according to the law of the of the giver of all these things to you. He is the owner, not you. You can't use your tongue as you like. You have to use it, even your own body. They are also trust with you. Allah has given it to you. You can't use your hand. But in the right path. Decreed by him to be right and straight. And whatever belongs to you is also owned by Allah. You are trustees. Number three, at the social level. I am counting political level, sovereignty for God. Economic level. No human being, either individually or collectively, owns anything here. Number three, all human beings by birth are equal. No high, no low. No superior, no inferior. So actually Tawheed which has now become only a creed, a belief. Allama Iqbal said, Zinda quwwat thi zamane mein ye Tawheed kabhi. This Tawheed was a living force, a revolutionary ideology. And now it has become a subject of scholastic discourse. Theology. Theology. This was the ideology. Now he propagated, propagated, propagated. Street preaching. Addressing congregations. Going to markets. Calling at the doors of individuals. Whatever was available. There were no other means. Means of communication. In this way, Toyn B said, Muhammad failed at Makkah, but succeeded, no, Muhammad failed as a prophet, succeeded as a statesman. Because at Makkah he appears to be like Jesus, propagating, going here, going there, saying sermons, so this was the what Muhammad was doing was also the same. So he was, whether he was prophet or not, whether you believe in him or not, but he was like Jesus, like the prophets. He was working like them. Now then he organized whosoever adopted and accepted his revolutionary ideology. And this had two stages, organization. To start with this relationship, if I have accepted you are the messenger of Allah, I have to obey you. No escape from it. What you are saying is not your own. It is coming from God. I believe in God. I have to obey. That was the fundamental basis of that organization. Listen and obey. But later on, when the active resistance and armed conflict was near at hand, 
he took baya from his companions i had explained baya this morning come place your hand here over my hand and pledge that you will listen me and obey me what am i say this was such a comprehensive pledge one of the companions has reported the text of that pledge bayana rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we pledge ourselves to the messenger of allah ala sami'i wa ta'a first of all we shall listen to whatever you say and obey whatever you say fil usri wal yusr whether the conditions are easy or bad and difficult in every case we shall obey wal mansate wal makrah whether we feel inclined to do that or we have to force ourselves to do that wa ala asarat alaina even if you prefer somebody else to us we shall not say that we were your old companions how come you have appointed this new comer young man as our amir no this is your prerogative you will do and we shall obey whomsoever you put at the helm of affairs we shall obey him also and we should not quarrel with them wala naqula bil haqq ayna ma kunna but we shall say and present our opinions wherever we would be we won't be dumb and deaf we will place our opinion but it is up to you to decide now i come to the second set of three steps first i call passive resistance as i said in my submission in some earlier discourse that actually the revolutionary start an offense the society is there people are peaceful all have accepted it as their destiny okay the rich are rich and we poor are poor okay we have to live that way but someone stands there it's wrong it's cruel it's discriminative is oppressive is exploitative so he had started the conflict the natural reaction logical reaction from the society and that social order would be to resist it try to stop it try to nip the evil according to them evil in the bud the first phase of this was for the first 3 years of his mission all persecution was focused on the person of muhammad nobody else was persecuted sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it was verbal persecution you have gone bad you are majnoon some evil spirit has overtaken you possessed you they wanted to kill his will power but when they saw that this is not successful people are getting down him especially our youth they have been attracted towards him and more dangerously our slaves they are gathering around him So now there was the call. Guard up your lines and defend your interests. And then started in the fourth year, after the beginning of his dawa, the physical persecution of torturing, keeping the youth bound by chains, keeping them hungry, turning them out from the houses. Go. and especially for the slaves beat them even kill them one couple 
was killed after worst persecution and torture. Sumaya and her husband Yasir. What was done to Bilal? A rope was fastened to his neck and it was given to the street urchins. Drag him on the streets of Makkah. And it was the stony streets. And then in the open sun, the sun was sending down fire and he was laid facing the facing sky, the burning ground. And then a rock put on his chest so that he could even not talk. But still he was saying, Ahadun, Ahad, Ahadun, Ahad, Ahadun. I believe in only one God. What happened, for instance, to another companion, Khabab bin Arth, Razi Allah. He was called and live cinders burning coal they were spread on the ground and then he was asked to take off your cloth your shirt lie down on it and he lay there the skin was burnt then the fat of the back that melted and in this way, the cinders were cooled down. Now the point was, for eight long years after the beginning of this persecution, physical persecution and torture, the command of the day, order of the day was, take all persecution without any retaliation. You are not allowed to raise your hands, even in self-defense. To this I had given the title Passive Resistance. Resistance is here. You have to keep standing on that position. Not going back. Stick to Tawheed. Say that I believe and I will follow Muhammad. You do whatever you like. You want to kill me? Okay, kill, kill me. But no retaliation. This was, I think, the master stroke of Muhammad What was the result of this passive resistance? Number one, the revolutionaries have to buy time to be able to reach more and more and more people. In the beginning, there are a few in very small numbers. If they also reply violence with violence, if they become violent, they will be crushed in total no time. So you have to buy time. Taking all persecution, verb, physical and verbal, but not retaliating. Isbiru, isbiru, isbiru. Have patience, have patience, have patience. Be steadfast. Bear it, bear it, bear it. For eight years, eight long years, this was the order of the day of Muhammad. The second result was that the silent majority in that city, in that society, its sympathies turned towards these revolutionaries. What are they doing? What have they done to Bilal? What was his crime? Did he steal something? Or did he Attack someone? No, no, nothing. He is being persecuted only because he believes in one God and believes in Muhammad that he is the messenger of God. Now you can imagine what would be the reaction. Silent majority is silent, but not deaf. It is dumb, can't speak. They don't have the courage to stand up and say, this is right, this is wrong. No, they don't have it. They are accustomed to obeying their masters and their leaders. But within their hearts, they have the sympathy for those who are facing this, bearing this. And this was actually, in the later stages, this was the deciding factor 
to people who went to fight against these Muslims when the armed conflict started. From within, they believed that Muhammad and his companions are the cream of our society. With whom are we fighting? With Muhammad, his character, with Abu Bakr, his character. They are the cream of our society. So that was one of the factors of the success during the last stage of armed conflict. Now there was an incident which happened through divine intervention. In the tenth year after the beginning of this mission, number one, Khadija, the wife, the only wife, 15 years older, she died. She was a rich woman. And she had supported Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was a consoling wife at home and she has gone. Number two, his uncle, Abu Talib, he had not come to believe and embrace Islam. But because it was a tribal society, he was supporting his nephew because he was the chief of the clan of Banu Hashim. So the whole tribe of Banu Hashim was supporting him and protecting him. He also died in the year 10th after the beginning of the mission. And Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is for us the year of grief, Amul Huzn. And now, the chief of Banu Hashim was Abu Lahab, who was the bitterest enemy. So now the decision was taken to eliminate Muhammad, kill him. Now there was no danger that the infighting would start among the Quraysh and that Banu Hashim will stand in revolt. No. He went to Taif in search of an alternate base. He met the three chieftains of Taif, presented before them the Dawa, and asked them, if you believe in me, and if you promise to support me, I can shift to Taif. Living at Makkah is no more possible for me. All the three rejected, humiliated him used abusive language and when he wanted to return the street urchins they were given the green signal teach him a lesson now they were pelting stones on him and his body was bleeding he had with him only one of his companions he was his slave, but then he had freed him and he had adopted him as a son. Anyhow, this, this was the saddest day in the life of Muhammad. And when he came back empty-handed from Taif, he couldn't enter Makkah. He sought the protection of some chieftain, other clans. One by one, two refused, the third accepted. And under his protection, he entered Makkah. This was the condition, Brother Faris, this was the condition. After ten years, longest and hardest work of Dawah, of Tabligh, of no less a person than Muhammad But then the divine intervention came. During the Hajj season, the same year, some people from the Khazraj tribe of Medina, they accepted Islam. When they went back to Medina, they propagated it. Next year, there were 15. And they said, send with us some of your disciples who can teach us Quran, the basis of the ideology. 
Then Musab bin Umair, a young man, he was sent with them. And sometimes after another blind companion, he was sent. Abdullah ibn Umar Maktoum. And in one year, most of the chieftains of both the main tribe of Medina, the Khalid and the Aus, they embraced Islam. Muhammad has not stepped there even now. All the work was being done by his two companions. There were three tri Jewish tribes over there. And two were the as real Arab, original Arab tribes, Aus and Khazraj. But majority of the people, because the leaders of the clans, they accepted. So in a way, these both tribes accepted Islam. And then they said, oh Muhammad, come to us. So the second, the alternate base was provided by Allah. Muhammad had not thought of Madinah or Yasrib. It was called Yasrib. Later on it was Madinah to Nabi, city of the Prophet. And briefly we called it only Madinah. Now he had a base. All the people who had embraced Islam at Bakka, it was declared imperative on them that they have to make hijrah. Come here, leave your homes and hearts, even if you have to leave your families back, this hijrah. So that all the force is gathered at one place, so that it can become a base for launching an assault on Bakka. Now here, what brother Kaya didn't agree with me, I brought, you know, the list of the eight expeditions. Muhammad took only six months to consolidate his position at Medina, building of the mosque, it was the government house, it was the parliament, it was the school for teaching, it was a monastery for the purification of souls, it was the center of that all activity. Number two, the brotherhood between people who were coming from Mecca, they were Quraysh, the tribe was different, it was a tribal society. And here who have embraced Islam, they are Aus and Khadraj. And there had been enmity between these tribes before. So now he integrated that party. One from the immigrants from Mecca, one from the helpers, we call them Ansar. They helped the, the Prophet. And they were declared to be brothers. And the Madani brothers, there are examples. He took his Makki brother and said, this is my shop. I will raise a wall in between. Half is yours, half is mine. Go ahead. This is my house. I raise a wall, divide in two. One is yours, one is mine. Even to the extent that one of them took his Muhajir brother, immigrant brother, to his home and said, I have two wives. Till that, this segregation and which I talked about and the wheel of the face, these commandments had not come. They were revealed later on in Surah Nur and Surah Al-Ahsab. He said, you choose one. I can't bear it that I have two wives and you have no family. Choose one. Your choice is first. I will divorce her and then you marry her. This was the integration of that society into one. Third work he did. He concluded Misate Madina, the Treaty of Madina. It was a treaty for the common defense of Madina with the three tribes of the Jews. So that if people from Makkah attack, we shall defend Medina 
as one organization. So this three steps. And then he started his <coughs> active resistance. I told you, what is active resistance? Now you challenge the system somehow or the other. Passive resistance now gone. It was before Hijrah. Six months pause. And from the very seventh month, the Prophet started sending groups, gorillas, challenging the caravans, the lifeline of Quraysh. The caravans going from Mecca to Syria, passing very close from Medina. They threatened it. And so to say, threatened the lifeline of Quraysh of Mecca. These expeditions, in four of them, Muhammad also participated. And wherever he went, he concluded treaties with the tribes of that area. All these tribes were under the influence of Quraysh. They were accepted as, although there was no formal government in the Arabian Peninsula, no state, but Quraysh were the kings of Arabia without any crown. They were the custodians of Kaaba. And in Kaaba were placed all the idols of all the tribes. So all the idols of all the tribes were hostages with Quraysh. If you harm Quraysh, they will throw out your god, your idol from Kaaba. So they enjoyed in the Arab Peninsula this hegemony. But now, wherever Muhammad went, he concluded a treaty. Whether they become now allies of Muhammad, or they said, we will remain neutral, Muhammad. Neither we shall help you against Quraysh, nor help Quraysh against you. In both cases, the zone of the political influence of Quraysh was diminishing. These two were the steps taken by him to challenge Quraysh. As a result, 1,000 soldiers strong army came out from Mecca. And then the first battle took place at Badr. I have discussed these things in very lengthy details. But I apologize that book is only in Urdu, not in English. These things I have discussed. Maybe after this round table, Brother Absar feels that he should translate this book. It's quite a big book, 400 pages. Not easy to translate. But maybe if Allah wills, it will happen. So now the sixth and the final phase of the revolutionary process of Muhammad started. And that was the armed conflict. It resulted in a six years long war. And there were battles. Battle of Badr, Battle of Oth, Battle of the armies. These were the battles. War was continuous. There were ups and downs also. Due to the mistakes of the Muslims, there were some setbacks also. But finally, Quraysh came to a conclusion that we have to have some treaty with Muhammad. Sixth year after Hijrah. Treaty of Hudaybiyah, what it meant between Quraysh and Muhammad. Quraysh recognized Muhammad that he is a power to reckon with. 
the chief tribe of Arabian Peninsula has accepted and recognized him. Allah called it in Quran when the revelation came. Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Oh Muhammad, we have given you a very clear victory. And please note, it was from this event, after this event, that the Prophet sent letters of inviting invitation to the kings all around Arabian Peninsula. The Emperor of Iran, the Emperor of Rome, Heraclius, of Iran, Khusro Parvez, Makokos, the Patriarch of Alexandria, Nagus, the Emperor of Ethiopia, etc., etc., etc. Before this, he never sent any letter, never sent any muballir anywhere. This is the revolutionary struggle. A missionary struggle spreads and spreads and spreads on ground. It doesn't establish any social order, political, social, economic order. Doesn't establish any state. The missionaries working for centuries and centuries and centuries. They never established a state. And our Tablirigam are now working, going to America, going to Europe, going even to Israel, going to Russia, going to China, South America, going. But not to establish the Deen of Allah. Only preaching and preaching and preaching. So I used to say one is the missionary struggle. That is also a struggle. You have to spend your time and money and everything. And the other is revolutionary. Marxism, accept it. Now be ready to sacrifice your lives and topple over this government or rule of Tsar and establish the system. This was the first example in the human history that Muhammad produced. After he had that victory inside the Arabian Peninsula, then he extended his sphere of Dawa to outside of Arabian Peninsula. But then, now I want to be very brief, in the eighth year after Hijrah, because when there was treaty for two years with the Quraysh, now there was time for preaching. So in these two years, lot of people had accepted Islam. And when in the eighth year after Hijrah, Muhammad proceeded to Mecca, he had 10,000 people with him. And the Mecca had to surrender without any resistance. A very few people died who couldn't bear it from among the infidels and mushriks of Mecca. And they had to accept whatever has happened, we have to accept. And after that, that position came, which I discussed in my earlier lecture. Qalatil Arabu Amanna Kullam Tuminu. When help, help of Allah came and you got the victory, you were triumphant to Muhammad and you saw. Now armies of people are entering the deen of Allah. They are coming. Deputations from that tribe. We accept Islam. We enter the deen of Allah. Another deputation coming from another tribe, from another corner of Arabian Peninsula. We accept. We pledge ourselves to you, O Muhammad. So the whole of Arabia here the deen of Allah became supreme. Now regarding revolution my stand is that no true revolution can be contained in any geographical or national boundaries. It is the litmus test of a revolution that it will go beyond if the ideology is forceful it will be accepted. So now the internationalization of the revolution of Muhammad started. 
through those letters a conflict started with the romans there were two fights two battles but i don't want to go into detail only i want to mention that now when arabian peninsula had been secured cleared of kufr all islam now he proceeded to internationalize his mission now because the title was contemporary pakistan with the we this possibility of islamic revolution but let me make one point i accept this total methodology of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam except i have made and each the hard in the last step i told you now these days it's not easy to take arms against the governments governments are very powerful they have standing armies they have police they have air force so it is not feasible although it is not forbidden in a country if it is practicable and feasible this movement of islamic revolution can take arms it is halal it is permissible but not feasible instead in that book of mine i have suggested what i told to you about gandhi and khomeini a peaceful agitation 